Good evening. Welcome to the Museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Program Series. Tonight, it is our pleasure to welcome New York Times bestselling author, Emily Spivak. She will present her book, Worn in New York, a contemporary cultural history of well-loved clothes and the people who wore them. At the end of the, her presentation, she will be signing books on stage. And when you were coming in, we gave you cards where you can ask questions to the author at the end of her presentation. Please join me in welcoming Emily Spivak. Hey, everyone. Well, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, FIT, for having me here. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Valerie Steele. Uh, thank you, Colleen and Faith, for, for having me. And uh, um, I'm glad to be here. So we'll start with the first slide. All right, so back in about 2007, I was on eBay looking for uh, vintage high heel shoes because at the time I was into vintage high heel shoes. And um, I came across this listing and it was for this 1960s Playboy Bunny costume. And it was in pristine shape. It had the original puffball tail, it had the stockings, it had the ears. But what was really striking to me is it also came with the ID card for the woman who's, who wore it. Um, and it, you can actually see it's pretty small up there because these are the images that are, were from eBay. Um, and it's a you know, black and white photo, her street clothes. Um, and there was something that was really kind of, uh, kind of stuck with me, the fact that, you know, you sort of see this costume, but then you actually saw the person behind it. Um, and it made me realize that eBay um, could be a place to not only, you know, transactionally sell things that you want to get rid of, but it could also be a place to uncover stories if you looked hard enough. Um, people weren't only selling things, um, but they were selling something far more intangible in the, you know, in the form of memories, in the form of stories, in the form of experiences. So I started collecting these stories. Um, and uh, let's see. Just trying to go to the next slide. Should I just be using the computer? not progressing. to see what the next slide is. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. So we can get started. No, we can use that. Use that? Okay. All right. Okay, we're back. We're back in business. So, uh, so from so from 2007 till 2014, I started collecting these stories that I was finding on eBay. Um, over the course of those seven years, I collected about 600 of those stories. And I saw all kinds of themes emerge from transformative life experiences, waxing nostalgic about the good old days. And it was like the stories I was finding, they were, you know, they were just in the, the auction, the auction post. It was kind of like these stories were like flowers kind of poking through the sidewalk cracks, like unexpected, like somehow they emerged. Um, so let me just give you a, a couple of examples so you know what I'm talking about. So these are, these are the images that I found on eBay. These are the subject headings or the titles that 
the people used when they were trying to get you to buy them. So the elegant and sexy red rayon special jacket. This was, this was the story that, that went along with it. So the seller says, this sale was a moving sale in my neighborhood. It was run by a woman in her 50s. She too had one of those faces. I think it took about eight seconds to find out why she was moving. She was joining a nudist colony. Okay, to be more specific, she is, quote unquote, relocating to a clothing optional environment. I'm not kidding you. I swear to you, I do not kid. She's been a weekend nudist for years, she said, and now she's retiring and moving up the coast and selling everything but my birthday suit. So that went along with the post, you know, selling it for 15, 20, 25 dollars. I don't remember the exact amount. The other, uh, the gown, uh, the red sequin gown, that's all it says. And then in the post, it says, I hate to let it go because it has great sentimental value. I was once levitated in it in a magic act. Um, Another example, just to give you a sense, and these, these images are kind of low res just because that is what was on eBay. They're, they're, the quality is kind of just what people, how they uploaded them. Um, so that was the subject heading. And um, the story said, my girlfriend bought these for my birthday back in 1995. We broke up shortly afterwards. She was so pissed, and that's so with many O's, that she cut the air bubbles on the back of both shoes with a razor. Needless to say, I haven't worn them much since. Funny thing is that they're more comfortable with the air bubbles cut than they were before. They have some cushion to the step, exclamation point. I stopped wearing them because I didn't want the guys at school to pick on my sneakers in the breakup. Aside from the air bubbles, they're in great condition. So I started collecting these. I started making this archive of all of these stories. Um, and there was a certain point where I think a couple of my favorites kind of re, like returned on eBay, like no one had bought them. And something clicked and I was like, I need to start actually buying these stories, um, buying these objects with the stories, not with the intention of actually wearing them, but just with like amassing this collection because what would it feel like if these stories actually just started arriving in the mail? So I did, and, um, and then I began actually showing the garments along with their stories in an exhibition context. This is, all, this is one of my favorites. Um, so I showed this, and the story goes, we're selling these men's jeans for our granddaughter, who bought them for a boyfriend that broke up with her before she could give them. All tags are still attached, and you could easily give these as a gift to a guy who would leave you, all caps, for his pedicurist. True story. Of course, if you are a guy who would leave his girlfriend for his pedicurist, these are for you. So I bought these. I started showing them. Um, as I sort of talk this evening about my work, um, part of my work is kind of about recontextualizing things, showing it in different, in different contexts. So the project started as a website, but then I started showing it in Philadelphia, and this is a series of garments that have stories attached in Portland, and in a variety of other contexts. And what was thrilling to me and why I felt like I could continue this project forever is because these stories are just so compelling. They're on a platform that isn't intended for these kinds of stories. It's people getting really personal, where you're not really sure why. Is it cathartic? Is it a marketing tool? Like, what is prompting people to share these stories with complete strangers? Um, and then it was also the way that people wrote, this sort of vernacular of the web, this informal way of speaking, all caps like they're yelling at you, um, you know, like misspellings, uh, emoticons. And it was just like you could really read between the lines. And also, a lot of these images, you could really read into those too, you know, the bedspread, the, you know, all the aspects of what was behind the, the, the clothing. Um, so that was really compelling to me. And it was just like, I think it also, as I said, when I started this feeling that like there, there are stories behind the clothes that we wear. And, um, and it's so universal that it's just like, these stories were almost like just coming out without people even intending to share them. And it was all kinds of people who were sharing them. So I, around that time, started thinking about, I guess maybe I'd always been thinking about clothing and, and the story, my own clothing and my stories. And 
I would look at my closet and I would see an archive of experiences and, and memories and tra tra uh, like travels that I had taken and um, you know hand-me-downs and, and every single piece felt like it had a story attached to it. So I started writing some of my own stories connected to a piece of clothing. And I very quickly realized that I was far less interested in my own stories and I was way more interested in other people's stories. I knew what my stories were. Um, but I wanted to talk to other people, and it felt like, you know, clothing is completely universal. We all wear clothing, minus the woman who was joining the nudist colony. Um, we all wear clothing, and we all walk through the world wearing that clothing. So, you know, it could, it's a storytelling device. So I started collecting these stories, and I knew I wanted uh, this project, Worn Stories, to be a book. But I had no idea how to make a book. So I started by making a website, warnstories.com, and just started experimenting with the idea, playing around with it, talking to friends, to you know, friends of friends, just trying to interview people and start accumulating stories. Um, and eventually, I was able to make Warn Stories into a book. Um, and you know, one of the things about this that I realized as I was collecting the stories for um, sentimental value and then started doing it for worn stories is that I was also trying to get these stories before they disappeared, um, before the person disappeared, before the post disappeared, before the person threw the clothing into the, you know, the goodwill bag um, and that you'd find it and have no idea what the story was attached to it. Um, so, so I started collecting these stories. Uh, let me give you a few examples. So this is um, a documentary filmmaker, Jeff Zimbalist, and this is a garment that he wore when he was kidnapped in India as part of a jewelry scam. Um, Simon Dunin, uh, this is a pair of Steven Sprouse biker shorts that he got in the 80s uh, during the AIDS epidemic, and that he wore them to exercise classes as a, tr as a way to try to overcome the malaise uh, that was coming, uh, you know, that was occurring around all of his friends um, getting diagnosed and the sickness that was kind of prevailing at the time. Um, this is uh, Albert Maisel's uh, traditional, uh, it's a Russian peasant coat called a fufaika, and he told me the story of uh, purchasing this while making his first documentary with his brother in Moscow, and then having uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov over to his apartment at the Dakota, as one does, um, and showing him the coat, Mikhail Baryshnikov recognized this style of coat and began crying. Um, so he tells the story of that. Um, and, and this is actually one of those examples where, you know, unfortunately Albert Mazels has since passed away and I'm so grateful to actually have been able to collect this story from him and to speak with him. Um, this is a, a a suit worn by Piper Kerman, who wrote Orange is the New Black. And this was the suit that she wore when she was sentenced. Um, and she talks, she talks about what that experience was like in choosing the outfit that she was going to wear to court and what it was like when she was sentenced. So, you know, when, what was, what was so satisfying about this is when I reached out to people and asked them if they would be interested in participating, sitting down with me, to be interviewed, um, the stories that people decided to share with me, what uh, you know, a common theme was that they didn't buy the garment thinking that this something was going to happen to them, that they were going to, I don't know, be kidnapped in India or um, make Mikhail Baryshnikov cry or something like that. They they bought it and then the story the, the they they wore it, they experienced life. And the story got mapped onto that garment. And it just felt like it was such a universal thing. Um, I really feel like, you know, as through this project, I mean, clothes are such a lens to understand people. And, um, and, it's, and it's hidden. You know, it's a really good way to just, it's, it's, it's a great access point um, to get someone to open up. So um, from this, uh, you know, I kept thinking about some of my favorite stories, and even the ones that I just mentioned here today, are steeped in a place, 
in a location. So, you know, Albert Maisel's in, in, in Moscow, or Simon Doonan in Los Angeles, or uh, Jeff Zimbalist in India. And I kept coming back to something that it, it felt like there was the story, the clothing, and also the place. So when I thought about what my next book was, I decided to make Worn in New York because it felt like, I mean, I, I certainly was not done collecting stories. The stories are just infinite. Um, I've lived in New York for, you know, a decade and a half or more, um, so I'm very familiar with this city, but it was more than that for me about why I felt like New York would be the right place. Um, I feel like, and I'm sure you all, I hope you'll agree with me, I think we wear our clothes differently in New York. Um, I start the book by saying in New York we wear our clothes hard. And I think we, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, we press, our bodies press, press against our clothing, our clothing then presses against, you know, everything that's happening around us. So the thing that separates us from, you know, as we're walking around the streets of New York are our clothes. And I think that, you know, New York really sort of has its way with us. Like, with, and we can go out, we can walk outside feeling like we look like a million bucks, and then like a, a bus splashes on us. Or, you know, someone steps on our, sho our new shoes on the subway, or um, an air conditioner drips on us. Or we're just like, it's August, and we're on the subway, and we're just sweating through everything that we're wearing. Um, there's just a different way that we wear clothes here in New York, and there's something that, like, you know, it, that, like our clothes, I mean, we wear down, uh, our shoes get worn out. Like, you know, there, there are things I just, I, I can't wear here that I can wear somewhere else just because I, I feel like I really kind of, I wear things down here. And then the other thing about New York is that, because we're, we're just on view all the time. I mean, it's kind of like we're on a runway whether we like it or not. And, um, you know, whether you're in the bodega or you're in Central Park, you're just kind of, people are looking at you, you're looking at people. And so there's just this very different experience about walking outside in New York and wearing your clothes. Um, there's just that, that private public boundary is just kind of, is looser here. So I decided to ask people, what piece of clothing reminds you of a significant experience or memory in New York City? And I got, I collected 68 stories for this book. Um, and anyone from, you know, people you would know, like Fab Five Freddy or Ad Rock from the Beastie Boys or Lena Dunham, to people you might not know but who are just kind of incredible people, like the first female firefighter for the FDNY or an astronaut. Um, so, you know, and I collected all kinds of stories. So this one is, um, this image is from Aubrey Plaza, the actress. And this is the uniform that she wore as an NBC page. Um, she stole it from 30 Rock after she got uh, fired from the job and then wore it on the first season of 30 Rock after she was cast to be in it. <laughs> um, so it's, it goes from that to this pair of boots, which uh, was worn by a man named Ben Bostick, who took his first trip ever to New York City, and on the flight back, he happened to be on the flight that Sully Sullenberger was uh, flying that then landed in the Hudson. So these are the waterlogged boots he was wearing that day, and he kept his whole outfit, um, but he tells the story of what it was like to have your first trip to New York, land on the Hudson, and, and what it was like to then, you know, return to the city and develop a relationship with it. This is a pair of underwear um, from a, a singer named Mira Zeitlin. She moved to the city um, in her, I think when she turned 40, and she wanted to get to know the city, feel comfortable, and she decided to train for the New York City Marathon. And as she was, was training, she was running around Prospect Park and she was suddenly felt like a huge impact and realized that she'd been bitten by a dog. And I can go into all the details, of, uh, but I won't because you can read it in the book, but the, she always kept the underwear. And they have the, um, it's hard to see from this image up here, but they have a big tear in, in the behind where the dog bit her. And she kept it as a sort of memento of her experience getting, getting acclimated to being in New York City. And she wound up finishing the marathon, and she says, you know, when I spoke to her that, you know, the marathon, it felt like, some, like a huge accomplishment, and getting, 
the, the ribbon and the metal after finishing, but the underwear almost felt like more of the metal to her. Um, there's also a story from Jenna Lyons. Um, she talks about her experiencing, experience going to the Met Gala and wearing this skirt, which kind of was disintegrating as she was wearing it. She was finding, you know, it was a feather skirt. She was finding it, finding feathers wherever she would go. And she couldn't figure out why there was, as she walked the red carpet uh, to the Met Gala, why there was like kind of a hubbub behind her and someone scrambling behind her. And she later realized that the guy was scrambling to pick up all the feathers she was losing as she walked because Beyonce was coming up behind her and they didn't want Jenna's skirts feathers in the photo op. So these are just a few of the stories. I thought I would actually just um, act read you one in its entirety too, just so you have a sense. Um, I also will say, as I'm just getting this out, there's a really, I, I was very um, deliberate about the photos. I mean, as you can see here, it's just a simple photo of the garment. And it's because I really want, when you read the book, whether it's Worn Stories or Worn in New York, I want the, the essence of the person to come through, their voice to come through, which I've tried to maintain, through the text. Um, I don't want you to make any judgments about who that person is based on anything that you see and any kind of depiction of who they are. So in some ways, the photo is almost secondary that, to the, the description of, of, who, of their story. Um, like, I almost want the photos to feel like a little bit empty and then the, the story kind of is, fills you with what, what's happening. So I'm going to read you a story from Morna, New York. This is... Um, uh, a writer named Ernie Glam, and um, I spoke to him uh, in his apartment in the Bronx when, we, when, when I collected this story. So this is um, as he told it to me, and it's edited down, condensed a little bit. This is his garment. Um, and it also is, is relevant because we're sitting here at FIT today, as you, will, as you will see. He says, I wore this outfit I'd made on the Joan Rivers show. Michael Alleg, Lee Bowery, James St. James, Amanda Lepore, and I had been invited as guests for an episode about club kids. We stayed up all night, of course, and I think we were all high on drugs during the taping. I know I was. We wouldn't have gotten home from the club until 5 or 6 in the morning, and then we had to be at CBS Studio Center at 57th Street at 7 a.m. I began working at Limelight in August 1990, and the producers for Joan Rivers came six months or a year after we had started Disco 2000 party, the Disco 2000 party because it took some time to build up its reputation. As the party became more outlandish and people started talking about it, TV producers showed up. On the night they came, I was wearing this costume, this one here, uh, I designed, but with a cage sewn into the collar that went around my head. They were like, you have to come on the show and wear the exact costume. So I did. We had created this pop culture hoax that was something called Club Kids, who were making thousands of dollars just being decadent and wild, which certainly wasn't true, but was one of the reasons Joan wanted us on the show. We would stick to that script and people would be outraged. The more outraged, the more media would want to cover our outlandish behavior. We intentionally devised this hoax, which then became real, and now Club Kids are a stereotype. We weren't nervous to be on Joan Rivers because we were all a bunch of attention whores, so it's not like the cameras made us nervous. Mostly, we were nervous that Joan Rivers was going to be mean to us. But she was really nice, and we were there for uh, the entire show. Afterwards, we took pictures of her backstage. I learned to sew at FIT because most of the crazy things Michael Alleg and I wanted to wear couldn't be found in stores. I would design our outfits from dead stock children's fabric I bought on 39th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. In the garment center at that time, you could find fun, innocent prints, and I would make them vulgar, like a jumpsuit with no back so Michael's ass would hang out. It was this combination of sweetness and obscenity we were going for. You have to put in context what was going on when Club Kids got started. It was the late 1980s and the AIDS epidemic was raging. If you were gay, you could die from having sex. All these young gay people were just becoming sexual, who were just becoming sexual were faced with this horrible disease. Club kids internalized that fear of sex and of sex equaling death. They responded to it by making themselves grotesque so they wouldn't necessarily be sexually appealing. 
but at the same time, you are wearing a very erotic outfit, like maybe your butt would be showing or you would be wearing bondage gear. It was also a very conservative time in the United States. Reagan was president, and we just had an economic meltdown. Big nightclubs closed, and the lavishness of New York pretty much ended. That allowed club kids to do low-budget DIY parties, like, let's have an outlaw party in a park and just buy a case of vodka, and it'll only cost $150. It was a total shift in mindset. From 1985 until 1990, I lived on South 3rd Street in Rodney in Williamsburg, when it was still all Dominican and Puerto Rican. I was going out all dressed up, and I would carry a mini baseball bat or stick for protection walking to and from the Lorimer Street Station. I wasn't scared of living there because it was a Hispanic neighborhood and I grew up in a Hispanic neighborhood. But people would see what I look like and try to start shit with me. I knew I had to have something to dissuade them. When I got to the nightclub, I would hide the stick or baseball bat in a nearby garbage can. At the end of the night, I'd pick up what I'd hidden and go home. Growing up in Sacramento, I lived in a Mexican bubble with my immigrant parents who were very strict. I was also around a lot of anti-Mexican sentiment. And I don't look like a typical Mexican person because I am much lighter than most, so I didn't fit in my neighborhood. People who were not Mexican didn't like Mexicans, and Mexicans didn't like me because they thought I was the white guy. And I was gay on top of it. There wasn't anything flamboyant in that bubble except mariachi. As soon as I left my parents' house and got to the University of Pennsylvania in 1980, I started dressing up in crazy clothes. I internalized that alienation and turned into this big freak. I had to justify not being accepted by putting on all this makeup and dressing crazily. By doing this, it was understandable that people would reject me because just being your normal self and not being accepted is very painful. So that is Ernie Glam, still goes by Ernie Glam. Um, and, you know, we sat and, and uh, I talked to him for a while in his apartment. He actually pulled out a bunch of clothes. You can watch the clip from his uh, Joan Rivers, from the Joan Rivers show that he's on. And he's wearing like that, but also with a huge cage around his head. You can find that on YouTube. So, you know, these are these collections, these archives that I've been making um, and been kind of conveying and, and, and showing people in different ways. And so, you know, I, I spend a lot of time, a lot of my projects originate on the internet or they wind up on the internet. And so I just want to talk about a handful of other projects that'll give you some more context about what I do, why I do what I do, um, and how it manifests itself online or off. So at one point, I um, had a blog for the Smithsonian uh, that was a clothing history blog called Threaded. And I was writing, and I would spend a lot of time doing research online. And at one point, I came across WikiHow. And WikiHow had all of these instructions for how to dress like a hippie, um, how to dress like a goth, how to dress preppy. And this was fascinating to me because when I was younger, you had to really work at it if you wanted to dress like a certain subculture. You had to listen to the music. You had to track down the clothes. Like, they weren't just avail readily available on the internet. Um, but I, I thought that this was fascinating, and I kept searching, and I, kept col I was collecting all of these how to dress likes. So I actually wound up making this project called How to Dress Like, where I scraped WikiHow for every single how to dress like, you know, how to dress like Drake, how to dress like Rihanna, but also how to dress, you know, you know, how to dress um, like a hippie if you go to a Catholic school, like very specific things. Um, and, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I was like, well, what does this say about, you know, identity and dress and subculture if all you need to do is go online and follow these like very kind of simplified step-by-step -step instructions on how to take on an identity, a personality. But on the other hand, I actually kind of like that there was this community out there that was like, hey, we'll help you. You want to dress like a princess? Like, here are the steps. You know, you want to dress like Drake? Here are the steps. We'll help you. So, but, but it, it stuck with me, this idea of how to dress like. And so I was asked by this, um, this art publication called Dis to do a project, and I decided to take this obsession that I was having with how to dress like and WikiHow um, in a different direction. If, if there was, it would be one thing if you could dress like something concrete, 
But what if you were trying to dress like a personality type? So I looked at Myers-Briggs personality types. I'd been thinking a lot about Myers-Briggs. And I looked at the Myers-Briggs website. And, I, and you know, there, there are, I think, 16 different personality types. And I chose the two most popular and the two least popular personality types. And they had descriptions on the website for what, those, what they were like, what kind of characteristics those kinds of people had. And so I wrote in the style of WikiHow step-by-step -step instructions on how to dress like certain personality types in this sort of like aspirational way or in this, you know, however you want to play with it. And so I, I had non-models who I cast um, to come with me and we looked at the step-by-step -step instructions that I had put together and they dressed as those, as those personality types. So that's, you know, kind of thinking about and then I wound up actually from there, uh, MoMA asked me to do a project when they had the Bjork exhibition, and I did a project called How to Dress Like the Sound of Bjork, which was also, you know, an abstract thing based on the, the tropes that are on WikiHow, based on the, the weird images that are on WikiHow, um, but how do you take something and translate, you know, a lot of... Uh, I think a lot about translation and how do you, how do you translate, you know, sound to text to image and so that was something that I did with this DIS project and also when I did it for, um, for MoMA and the Bjork exhibition. From there I also, I think, um, I, I then discovered through my internet research um, Sky Mall, which many of you may be familiar with, um, had, was selling many, many types of scented t-shirts. T-shirts that um, smelled like uh, Chicago hot dog, New York pizza, Las Vegas money. Um, this is um, Mai Tai coffee, um, uh, California sunshine. And I became kind of obsessed with these. And there was a period of about three, four, or five months where I was living in Los Angeles and I just wore these t-shirts. Um, I just was wearing scented t-shirts. And it was at a time, I th the way I think about clothing, as you may have deduced at this point, is not about high fashion. Uh, it's not about the sort of superficial aspects of it. It's not about the exclusivity. It's about the kind of everydayness of it. Um, and it's also kind of like, I think oftentimes fashion with a capital F is taken very seriously. So I was just like, kind of wanted to just have fun with it and see what it would be like instead of, you know, walking around with like some designer something on, to walk around smelling like a hot dog, uh, you know, a t-shirt that smelled like a hot dog or a pizza or whatever Las Vegas money is supposed to smell like. And I would write descriptions on Instagram of what I, you know, what my experience was like and what, the, what I felt like my interpretation of those scents were because frequently that, I mean, what does Las Vegas money smell like? I don't know, but it didn't smell like what the t-shirt smelled like. But I had a lot of fun and people kind of got to know that I was doing this and so there was a performative aspect of it where people would kind of come up and they'd ask if they could like sniff me, sniff my t-shirt. Um, and it was, it was fun. It was, it was an experience to just kind of like, you know, what is it like when you, you know, there are sweat stains on clothes. We can think about that. You know, we can think about the smells that we exude, perfume, but like what if we're actually very deliberate about it? Um, and for me, it was an exercise in translation. Could I describe what that scent was and what that experience was like wearing that scent, that t-shirt, and then put it on Instagram? Um, this is the Chicago hot dog. Um, I will say it did not smell, it, it just didn't smell very good, but um, it did not, and also you're supposed to be able to smell it from six feet away, uh, which, but you couldn't, you really had to get up close to smell it. Um, but in this kind of th thinking about um, our bodies and, and what our bodies do to clothing and what clothes do to our bodies, I also decided, um, I guest edited an issue of um, Good Magazine, uh, their clothing uh, issue, and I decided to sort of take that, that, that idea of smell a little bit further, and I, and I, I think that um, sweat stains on clothes are kind of beautiful. Um, I think that they're intriguing, like when you're on the subway and you just kind of see someone and like they've got this like totally crazy shape on their back from the sweat stain. So I decided to kind of take the typical fashion spread um, and turn it on its head. And I did a, 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 
a spread that was about sweat stains on clothing. Um, because, you know, my feeling is like we try so hard to be in control of our appearance and we try to flaunt it. It's like what I was saying about why I felt like a book about New York. We, we go out, you know, we're very aware of how we, we look. But then just sometimes our body takes over and our, you know, or our clothes take over and have, it, have their way. So to that end, I, um, I'm, I've also thought a lot about, um, so, you know, one way you could call it a malfunction or you could call it, you know, I don't know, something lovely that your body sweats and sweat stains get on clothing. But then I also started thinking about um, wardrobe malfunctions. And um, so I did a project for Vistoy, which is this art and fashion publication. Um, they had an issue on failure. And so um, as I do for quite a few of my projects, well, I, I took it online. I took it uh, this time to Craigslist. And I posed a question on, uh, to di in different cities all over Craigslist. Has your clothing ever malfunctioned? Have you ever had a wardrobe malfunction? And I got all kinds of responses from all over the country. I wrote my own. I probably got 40 or 50 in the, you know, over the course of a month. And I was very surprised, by the way. So many people, um, their pants split and they're just not wearing underwear. That was just like a very common clothing malfunction that I heard over and over again. But it was this idea that like sometimes, you know, our clothes just do what they're going to do. Like it's, you know, Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl, but like what happens when it's everyday people? Um, I, so again, it's this idea of like stripping out the pretension, having fun with the stuff that we're wearing every day, um, not taking it so seriously, playing around with it. Um, but also using kind of like thinking about our clothes, our everyday clothing, you know, going back to sentimental value. These are people who, some people were selling these incredible garments. Um, but for the most part, like what I showed you, they were kind of like everyday clothes. Um, and so I think about those kind of iconic elements a lot. Um, so I, um, I don't know if any of you recall, there was an article in the New York Times um, a few years ago at this point, and it was about uh, President Obama's nighttime ritual, or rituals. And one of those things was that he would eat seven almonds a night. Um, but there was a small paragraph in that, um, in that article about how um, he had this fantasy to open a t-shirt shack in Hawaii that only sold medium-sized white t-shirts. And he had this fantasy because he, it came out of a decision-making fatigue. Um, when no decision felt like it was the right decision, he would look at his then chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, and in code, he would say medium, and Rahm Emanuel would respond white. And so they had this thing that was going back, this medium white t-shirt. And so I read about that, and I decided to make him that t-shirt shack in Hawaii. Um, which, you know, maybe is a crazy thing to do, but I just felt compelled to do it. I was intrigued by the idea that, you know, the white t-shirt is this kind of simple, essential, iconic garment, um, and that that for him symbolized a respite from decision making. So this was um, something I did. It was an installation that uh, went up the um, last two weeks of his term and the first two weeks of our current president's term. Um, and uh, it was volunteer run. Um, people came from all over the U.S. to volunteer. There it was an addition of a thousand T-shirts, all medium sized, uh, forty-four dollars, because he's the forty. He was the forty-fourth president. Uh, the proceeds uh, benefit two organizations: one, a youth-based Get Out the Vote organization, and one local. Uh, charity in Hawaii, an organic farm that Michelle Obama supported. Um, his sister, President Obama's sister, presided over the opening of the t-shirt shack, which was not entirely a shack, but it was, it, as I said, an off-site installation of the um, Honolulu Museum of Art. So it was in this weird indoor-outdoor mall um, right next to a Bed Bath & Beyond. So people would walk by, many people knew about it when they walked in, but frequently people were like, what is this? And um, because I wanted, you know, I wanted it, it was for him, it was a tribute to President Obama, but I also wanted it to be an experience that people 
had, um, you know, for themselves where they could walk in and they could kind of have a respite from any kind of decision making. I mean, what is that experience like to go into a retail space and there's only one thing to buy, you know, on repeat, just over and over and over again. And so, you know, we are all inundated with this decision making fatigue, you know, whether you're President Obama or whomever. Um, and so I wanted it to be just kind of a quiet, calm space. Um, so we sold almost all of the thousand, the addition of a thousand t-shirts. Um, President Obama got the first t-shirt. Um, this is, this is a box that was sent to Obama. Um, and, uh, supposedly what I've heard is that he was very tickled by it. Um, he actually, a year later, sent me a handwritten thank you note, uh, thanking me for the t-shirt shack, which was pretty bonkers to get, um, a letter from President Obama in the mail. Um, and um, it was just, it, but it was this project that I felt compelled to do. Um, one, as I said, a tribute to him, but also because this just like what a medium white t-shirt could symbolize, um, this classic garment. Um, and um, so, uh, and, and I'll also just say, here is, um, here's Obama, thank you. Um, here's Obama in a, it looks bigger than medium, but uh, in, a, in, in what I w imagine is a medium, medium white t-shirt. And we had these posters that we gave away during the exhibition. Um, my final project that I will just talk to you about before opening it up for questions is uh, my most recent project. This is um, a project that was at MoMA um, and it's called An Archive of Everything Worn to MoMA from November 1st, 2017 to January 28th, 2018. Um, and so perhaps some of you saw this or participated in it and um, submitted your, uh, what you were wearing to MoMA that day. But essentially what happened was MoMA asked me to do this project and I was given access to MoMA's archives. And I spent a lot of time in the archives um, and there were these incredible photos of exhibitions and from the past. But what I couldn't find were any kinds of photos, any documentation of people who had come to MoMA, what they looked like, uh, what visitors looked like. And there just wasn't anything. I kind of, I think I may have stumped the archivists there. Um, and I started talking to different people who worked at MoMA or who had worked at MoMA. And there's this one woman who worked at MoMA for 30 years and she told me, she would sit at the front desk and she told me how um, Andy Warhol would just come into the entrance and just stand there and observe and watch people. And, you know, there was a part of me that really wished that he had documented that and um, because I felt like there was a lot that we could learn from that. So I decided to do, a, to do it myself, um, but in a way that was um, democratically generated, uh, crowdsourced, where you could walk into MoMA and you would see these signs, like the one that's here. This is in um, the women, one of the floors of the women's bathroom. Um, you could find these, these prompts in elevators, on the volunteer desks, asking you to submit, a, like to write up via text message what you were wearing that day. And um, over the course of the few months that this project happened, we got um, about 5,000 responses, um, which was incredible. And, um, but what I really wanted to do with this project and to kind of come full circle back to sentimental value, I was curious what would happen if I gave people a prompt and I had them text something. Because I think that the way we communicate via text message is very informal, um, it's very casual, it's not like someone like going up and, and formally interviewing you. And the responses I got were fantastic. Um, I'm gonna show you just a brief clip of this is, it, it was, so it was projected on, um, on the third floor. And let me see if I can get this to, oops, get this to start. So this is what it looked like. And um, you can see that uh, people wrote little bits, they wrote, things that were very conversational in nature, um, but I'll let you read them for a minute.
So that's that's just a little clip. And um, so what you can see from this image is that there was also, um, there was a description of the project and then there were also two kiosks. So you could walk over to an iPad and you could type in what you were wearing um, or you could do it on your phone from wherever you were in the museum. Um, this, all of these submissions also wound up on a site um, on, uh, that MoMA hosted called everythingworn.moma.org, which you can all check out and see all of these. And I, um, what I loved about this project, I was terrified the day before because I was like, oh my gosh, maybe this is not going to work, but it actually worked, which was thrilling, is that people just really opened up and you could read between the lines, just like in Sentimental Value, you could read between the lines. Um, you know, there's one submission that was like, I think I jotted this, this one down. Um, Black high-waisted jeans, a futures female tee, a light blue wash denim jacket, and a sunshine yellow bag. You know, there were these political, political or um, activist type messages. When the bomb cyclone hit, people talked about how they're, um, they were wearing the same pair of underwear for multiple days because their flight had been canceled. Um, when the marathon happened, people talked about the marathon and wearing their shoes and, um, you know, wearing their, their sneakers and their metal. Um, you know, there's one that I love. Um, this one person says, onesie week, what up? Today we're doing the sleeveless jumpsuit in a beige rayon I love, all crinkly with floral embroidery in the same beige, top with a yellow scarf because I forgot this bra peeks through the neckline, whoops. Also black work shoes because I hurt my foot again. So there's just like this, like there's this conversational element and, um, and it's just this demo democratically generated way of gathering who we are at this moment in time. And so um, this project then became a, um, a limited edition book that was uh, given over to uh, MoMA's archives. So now it, is be it has become part of MoMA's archives. So that gap that I saw hopefully will be filled and someone can come back years from now and find out what we were like and you know, what memes we were into, what brands we were into, what was politically relevant to us through these text messages. Um, so anyway, that is, uh, that's, those are just some of my projects. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. I guess I have some here. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, one question I have here is, how did you go about getting the people in Warren stories to share their stories? So the stories, and I think I, I, um, I forgot to mention this, the stories came, um, you know, they were friends of mine, friends of friends, people who I admired, and with all of these projects, they're, um, with both books, people from Craigslist. So I would post on Craigslist and I would ask people to share their stories, to share you know, a little bit of their story with me. Um, and then I would decide if I wanted to pursue it and, and interview them. Um, people were just willing to open up. I mean, I'm not sure from this person's question um, if, if they're asking specifically you know, how I gathered the stories, but you know, I, would, I would find the person, um, I would reach out to them. It was a pretty simple request. I would speak to them and gather the story and transcribe it and edit it down. And specifically for Warren in New York, I knew that there was just no way that I could paint a comprehensive picture of the city, but I wanted to be as diverse as I could in terms of geographics, professions, backgrounds, um, as much as I could to just kind of at least represent parts of the city. So I hope that answers that question. What subcultures do I see rising in New York? I mean, I think that this is a kind of an incredible moment. Um, just, I think that kind of anything goes right now. And so I don't know if I have a specific answer to that, but I just feel like there's an openness. Um, thankfully, we live in a city where there's, you know, where anything goes and where people are, I think, for the most part, pretty accepting, at least that's my experience. Um, so that may not be the best answer that, you know, what the person was, was hoping for, but I, I, I think that that's also why this, this book, why Warren in New York could be so successful, because it is, you know, 
absolutely not homogenous here. And, um, and, you know, you can get a little bit of everyone. You can go and talk to someone who owns a bodega in the Bronx, and then you can also, you know, go talk to Jenna Wortham about what she, uh, I'm sorry, to Jenna Lyons about what she wore um, to the Met Gala. Um, what is my next project? Um, I have a variety of projects I'm working on. I, um, I mean, one thing that's ongoing is I have a column for the New York Times um, that's called the story of a thing. So from this experience, from all of these experiences, um, and from you know how well worn stories and worn in New York were received, um, the New York Times got in touch and asked me if I wanted to do a column kind of similar. And so, so for the past couple of years. Um, every month, I interview someone, a cultural figure, about an object in their domestic space that has some significance to them um, that you may not expect that that's, um, that's, yeah, that's unexpected. And so it usually runs, it's online, and then it runs in the, um, in the style section on Sundays. And um, so that's, that's an ongoing project. I think that's everything here. So, oh, this yeah. Sure. Yeah. That doesn't exist or that can't? So I'm, I'm kind of stumped. I can tell you about a garment that I was very excited to learn existed. Um, and I still don't have it in my possession, but um, I was in Japan, and uh, I saw these men in these garments. This may be something that's like very common, and, and people are going to say like, "Oh, of course." But they were in these jackets that were inflated, um, and I didn't understand why. But they were—they just were, were going about their business, doing their thing, um, and uh, and then I saw it again. I went to Seven Eleven at in Japan and saw another guy and realized that they were cooling jackets, that they had fans in them and they kind of were inflated, but the, the, they were keeping them cool. So um, I, I went to a, um, a, a workwear store in Japan and tracked it down and tried it on and, um, you know, had that experience. And, and then I was like, I don't know if I can get, like, I don't know if this is just gimmick. Like, am I going to wear this and like walk, um, you know, like, do I need this thing? Um, so it's a garment that I was really glad to know existed, but I didn't wind up buying it. It's pretty cool. Well, thank you all. Um, it was great to speak with you. And if you have any other questions, you can reach me, and I'll be signing books, too. <laughs>